I'm very excited to uh, have this opportunity to introduce Dr. Orhan Yadar. Um, she is Associate Professor of Geography in the School of Geography, Development and Environment at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Her research focuses on displacement, forced mobility, gendered violence, and refugee politics. Currently, she is leading a team of interdisciplinary scholars on the study of mobility and well being among refugees in Tucson. Um, you can find her work on that subject and also on other subjects related to today's research in many journals, and I have to read these because I couldn't remember them. The Annals of the Association of Geographers, Geoforum, Geopolitics, Gender, Place, and Culture, a journal um, on which she also serves as uh, one of the members of the editorial board. Uh, Geohumanities, Progress in Human Geography, Inter-Asia, Eurasian Geography and Economics, as well as many book chapters, which I will not enumerate. And significantly for us here today, lastly, but not least, um, where did I put it? In 2021 with uh, Rutledge, she published a book, Mobility and Displacement, Nomadism, Identity and Postcolonial Narratives in Mongolia. Um, I'm not going to tell you what this book is about because I think that would be taking away from uh, Dr. Miata's presentation. So without further ado, I will cede the floor to her. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Miata to Indiana University. So thank you, Dr. Miata. Uh, so thank you all uh, for being here and then thank you all for being there remotely. And again, I'd like to thank Sam for inviting me to give this talk and also everyone else who's involved in taking care of the logistics. It has been an incredible trip. In fact, I uh, this is my third time to be in Bloomington. Uh, first time I was here about 15 years ago when uh, Chris was uh, still here. And when I came, uh, it was really cold, the snowy, uh, Bloomington. And uh, later on, I came back to attend Central Eurasian Studies Conference about 10 uh, years ago. In fact, I think the next conference is going to take place here back in Bloomington. So uh, I will be back uh, to that conference. So it's nice to be back. And then I love the tall colors and beautiful uh, crisp air, which we don't get back in Tucson that much. So Anyway, um, briefly about my background. So as the fan mentioned, thank you for the introduction. I'm a political geographer. I was trained as a political scientist, and but I found geography as my academic home. And as it turned out, geography is incredibly fascinating discipline. And I, I've been so happy to be part of this dynamic discipline. And I try to combine these two disciplines, uh, intersection of uh, geography and political science. I study questions of political questions of power, subjectivity, citizenship, and belonging. But also, I, I'm interested in how they manifest geographically and spatially. And so for the uh, several years, as like uh, Sam mentioned, I have been working on multiple projects, uh, working with refugees in Tucson. Again, I'm interested in questions of forced displacement and their sense of negotiating their sense of home. And it's been incredibly uh, rewarding, fascinating uh, experience. Um, but uh, today I'm presenting on my book here, on Mobility and Displacement. But I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I call my presentation slightly differently, uh, Mobility and Displacement and nomadic imaginaries and performative realities in Mongolia. That was the title, subtitle that I wanted from my book, but book editors preferred the title that you see is specifically post-colonial narratives in Mongolia. But I kind of like my side, I just thought, hey, in my presentation, I can use my subtitle. So here's uh, my presentation. Um, so, I would like to, again, preface my presentation with the acknowledgement that what I'm presenting today is part of ongoing process. As a critical social scientist, I do not believe knowledge is static, permanent, or unchanging. It's always evolving, it's always 
morphing and changing, right? So which is to say that um, I welcome suggestions, comments, counter arguments, critiques, and so on. But this is uh, my conceptual framework as it stands today. Um, so because my presentation is on my book, I will present bits of experts from the book. Uh, and um, I will start with introduction and walk through some theoretical uh, framework, which I use for my book. And then I will uh, present two uh, interrelated intersecting imaginaries. And then I, I offer some concluding thoughts. So uh, to give you a little background on why and um, how I became interested in this topic is um, somewhat related to my own sense of negotiating my place here in the United States. Um, I have lived in the United States uh, most of my adult life. And during this time, I've been negotiating really uh, where I belong, e either here in the United States or back in Mongolia. and then back and forth, contested uh, sense of uh, belonging. But also I've encountered so many different types of stereotypes about Mongolia and its people. And if the, one of the biggest one is, of course, when I say I'm from Mongolia, people would ask, is Mongolia part of China? With, to which I always say very firmly, no. <laughs> Second one is, is uh, Mongolia nomadic? Or the nomadic Mongolia is one of the foremost prevalent images of Mongolia, which is the focus of my presentation today. So I think for a long time, I do discuss this in my book that I, I have been content with this image associated with me. I thought the nomadic Mongolia, it sounded poetic, sounded romantic, sounded unique, right? So what's there not to like? So I have been content with this image associated with me. I never contested, never asked why majority of the Mongolians who are not nomads are not represented in this imaginary, nor did I ask uh, this discursive disconnect between what Mongolian herders are called in Mongolia, masjid is what we call. So if I run into a herder family, I would say masjid, we don't say nudjid, which is nomadic family. So I didn't really put pause and question that, right? And foremostly, I don't think I um, wondered why few have ever contested this imaginary, despite, despite the fact that most of the Mongolians do live in urban settlements. So, um, so that's what I'm hoping to uh, tackle in today's presentation, and I try to do so in my book. And so, to guide my presentations, um, so presentation for today, I have a few questions. So what accounts for both the um, production and consumption of the trope of nomadism, which has been so firmly blurred, uh, the line between fantasy and reality in the representation of Mongolia? Uh, what can the colonial relations inform us understanding the knowledge politics that are at the heart of producing and sustaining this imaginary? And how do we understand the technologies of the state, Mongolian state, in co-opting this imaginary? And what does it tell us that only few have ever contested this flawed representation of the everyday and lived experience of most Mongolians today and different historical periods in the past? So to uh, ponder these questions, I rely on post-colonial intellectual tradition. Despite its shortcomings, uh, post-colonial framework provides an epistemological space uh, to unsettle the knowledge regime that's too deeply rooted in a colonial encounter and subsequent Western imperialism. So I provide this a uh, little bit of background in my um, book uh, when I was a grad student. Uh, this I mean, uh, uh, so I, I went to grad school in uh, University of Hawaii, political science, which is uh, well known for its very critical orientation. And I was exposed to a lot of different critical theories at the time, but somehow post colonial theory really resonated with me, specifically the way it described about 
this uh, world beyond Eurocentric imaginaries, right? So it unsettles this very hegemonic knowledge regime that's rooted in colonial period and subsequent Western imperialism. So despite its flaws and limitations, I have uh, definitely, um, uh, I, I owe my, I guess, uh, growth as a scholar to uh, this intellectual tradition. So uh, since Edward Said uh, kind of uh, pioneered this, uh, his political theory in 1970s, uh, post-colonialism has been embraced by generations of scholars uh, to push against Western imperialism and the colonial legacy beyond its act of physical and political manifestations. And as a result, uh, the post-colonial approach has produced a wealth of scholarship, and many of which came uh, from scholars uh, beyond, again, the Occident Euro-American world, right? And uh, these scholars collectively uh, developed a robust body of work that counters the dominant knowledge production and circulation and cultural representations of the colonial other. In particular, the Said's work, especially uh, out of place uh, in this profound articulations of his sense of uh, negotiating his place. And um, he um, talked about he, him being out of place, rooted in this intersecting forces of displacement, exile, and prejudice and discrimination he experienced in multiple places and spaces he occupied, right? So that resonated with me personally, but also I think it resonates with experiences of millions of people who have been similarly subjugated to discrimination, violence, racialized violence, and so on. And then, <clears throat> but I'm mindful of the limitations of this theory does have its shortcomings. One of the key shortcomings of this uh, theory is that it puts um, this colonial period in temporal like stages, uh, pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial, right? So it seems like it's like a linear temporal path. And also because it uses the word post before colonialism, it seems to hint that colonialism is over, when in fact, legacy of uh, colonialism is still very much alive. And there are so many communities, indigenous communities, native peoples are still dominated, controlled, and their uh, resources are extracted, lands are occupied by settler colonialism. So to think that colonialism over will be really Plot, right? So, but despite, uh, oh, and also another uh, key, um, I think, shortcomings, I would say, as uh, the Sayyidin ge ge uh, geographical and political delineation deal with Occident versus Orient, and specifically uh, with uh, colonial territories occupied as key European powers. And I think that is limiting. So I argue that this, this designation needs to expand to a wider field of political communities beyond European controlled lands. That includes Mongolia, right? The Indo it was controlled by any European powers. The experience of Mongolia um, speaks to similarly to experience of many, many indigenous communities that have been subjugated by colonial powers and imperialism later on. And then another uh, flaw uh, I would say uh, is uh, that it tends to generalize, homogenize experiences of disparate communities' experiences as the story of the colonized, when in fact, each story is unique, each experience is unique, and we cannot necessarily put them in one box and call it story of the colonized, right? So, <clears throat> but in spite of that, I think post-colonialism has allowed us this epistemological space in which we can really see some common threads across these dis disparate stories, uh, stories of subjugation, stories of resource grabbing, stories of racial violence, and so on. And I think regardless of uh, spatial temporal differences, there is something common, which uh, all these post-colonial scholars are trying to push against and unsettle. But one of the, to me, profound um, contribution of this uh, post-colonial intellectual tradition lies in 
pushing against the epistemological uh, imperialism, if I can call it, uh, which is this knowledge produced by um, the Western um, dominated uh, scholars and institutions and travelers and just name it, this of knowledge, very heavy Euro uh, Western centric, right? In which, uh, again, uh, the, the binaries that uh, developed versus undeveloping, civilized versus uncivilized, and Western versus Eastern, South, uh, just there are the binaries. And then in which um, the West is glorified and the West is put in the position of superiority. Uh, and then the rest is again, uh, treated as inferior to Western cultures and uh, knowledge production. So I think it's been uh, helpful in that. And then I think it goes to the uh, power and wealth, uh, this cooling of powers uh, served during their physical colonial occupation that sustained, unfortunately, even the colonial period actually ended their uh, power to define knowledge, what's the right knowledge, what's the acceptable knowledge, what's the right way of knowing and representing, it has been unfortunately concentrated very much, again, dominated by um, the Western uh, central uh, world. So the counter this uh, systematic epistemological imperialism, post-colonial scholars have emphasized the authority of the subaltern voices. We have as much as to say as the anyone else scholars in the Anglophone community, right? And a post colonial approach challenges the view of this centering, privileging the Western worldview, and then say we matter too, our voices matter. We, we have just as much authority in this. Uh, in understanding the world, just as you are. Not that there, there's a force of wrong, but we want to matter. So I think that's what the, has been one of the biggest contributions of post-colonialism. So, uh, and I think it's true for um, Mongolian studies as well. Uh, when you think about uh, Mongolian studies, in, in Mongolian studies is an example, but if you think about any other studies, again, it is very much, despite that it's, it's very like area studies based, if you look at English sources, it's very much dominated by scholars who are from Euro American Western um, cultures, which is to say that uh, the knowledge produced by scholars from the Occident, to borrow Said's term, it's not right or wrong in the qualitative sense. Of course, an incredible body of work has emerged and has come out from these scholars. And I, in fact, I do owe my uh, growth as a scholar uh, to this many, many incredible uh, scholars, including uh, Chris Ackwood, who was here. Um, and so, but uh, I think, and also I, I'm not uh, suggesting that Mongolian scholars have a uniform voice. Mongolian scholars see the worldview the same way, or that what we say about Mongolia is the right way or the more dominant way. No, I'm just suggesting that, in fact, I would say that what I'm presenting today is not shared by many of my peers, including I mentioned, uh, so one of the uh, closest work I uh, references um, Nandoha's work on Buryat shamanism, and then also on Dara's work on common resource uh, management in Mongolia. They, we kind of deal with the similar geographic temporal areas, but we see it so differently. We approach the subject from different theoretical angles, philosophical creed, and disciplinary backgrounds that we are not the same, right? So, what I'm hoping to propose is that because we can offer as uh, Native scholars in Mongolia, we can maybe allow some more nuances in uh, Mongolian studies. So, <clears throat> so post-colonial approach has been incredibly helpful to assert some voice 
in intellectual tradition that's dominated by a Western centric world. So, uh, my, yes, please. Next thing, please. So, to um, understand this epistemological uh, workings of, of Mongolia as a land on the net, first, let me try to um, attempt to. Uh, define what I mean by nomads. So if you don't mind clicking the next slide. So a nomad, so etymologically, uh, it means a member of wandering pastoral tribe, right? And it's a, uh, the uh, OED Oxford English Dictionary uh, uh, defines nomad as someone uh, who travels from place to place and find fresh pasture for its animals and has no permanent home. And of course, the uh, extended view is an actual person and wanderer. So, and there are a few other uh, uh, definitions that are used for crib. The nomad implies ceaseless cycles of mobility and lack, lack of fixed assets. For Krober, um, uh, nomads are uh, people making their living wholly off their flocks without settling down to plant. In all these cases, nomad is defined by mobility, boundedness, and impermanence. And uh, you can uh, click on the next one. I uh, I draw from Luz and Katari's uh, the seminal work Thousand Plateaus. And in, in this text, they really tackle this uh, idea of nomad, nomad space in a contrasted with uh, polis. So they use uh, this uh, two games. On one hand, you see chess. On the other hand, you see game of go. In chess, uh, it's, how many of you play chess? Most of us know how to play chess. And even if you don't play, you know that there is hierarchy in, uh, in the game. Each piece has its property. That property defines its ability to move around and then its uh, ability to function on that board. So I don't play a Go. How many of you play Go? All right. So I don't know Go at all, but from what I understand, uh, it doesn't have the same kind of property as chess pieces. It doesn't have hierarchy and that between pieces, they're all equal and then they can all move in all kinds of directions situationally and just wherever there is space, maybe, right? So uh, Duluth and Guattari use this uh, analogy to express uh, nomad space. So that the space uh, uh, go pieces go is that nomad space, it's a smooth space. There is no uh, borders, boundaries. There is no hierarchy. They can go wherever there is space as long as a lot. I mean, the, the smoothest space is there. And so according to them, as a nomad is someone who occupies nomad space. Nomad space is smooth space, according to them, right? And the smooth space is infinite, open, and unlimited in this unstable strided space, they argue that nomads move from one point to another perpetually without aim or destination, without departure or arrival. And nomad essence, they argue that is determined by occupying and holding a smooth space. So they lose, uh, so uh, as you can see, uh, policies is very much like the chess game. There are hierarchies, internal structure, and then there's restriction in how they move about. So um, <clears throat> beyond, this, uh, beyond this analogy, the nomad figure may be understood as a subject who's not confined to hierarchy like the piece in Go and they move, their moves are situational and flexible. In this open trade, the nomad, nomad figure goes along from point to point as needed without again beginning or end. Therefore, the diet of nomad figure and nomad space can be understood or can be mediated through mobility. Uh, which in the mobility, mobility itself is uh, in, turn, uh, in turn shaped by environmental factors. So, so using, infusing all of these, I define nomad 
figure is an individual who moves frequently and irregularly in a smooth space. Uh, whose mobility is primarily dictated by environmental factors such as the need for uh, water, pasture, and or climatic conditions. In this definition, both spatial freedom and mobility are essential uh, characteristics of nomadism. But before discussing the construction of nomadic identity, uh, both inside and outside Mongolia, uh, I will briefly discuss environmental determinism because there is this idea that Mongolia is a nomadic society because the environmental conditions dictated that it was, in, in the environmental conditions allowed nomadism to be this dominant way of living, right? Because there were sparse pasture and then temperature variations did not allow for Mongolian society to settle down, to grow things, grow cities, the nomadic uh, lifestyle was the ideal uh, livelihood. So geographers, unfortunately, I did mention that geography is an incredible discipline, but it does have this unfortunate legacy. Uh, geographers were one of the notable influential um, figures in creating the idea of environmental determinism. And then uh, they tried to explain uh, social and cultural practices and economic development with the logic of uh, environmental determinism. So this way of conceptualizing human and nature uh, suggests that environmental forces determine societies developmental and of course at the time they used civilization as one of the things they looked at right so developmental and civilizational trajectory so if you have x and y environmental conditions your civilization is gonna be x and y and if you have hot in the human climate your culture is destined to be x and y so it was very much defined by your environmental conditions right some of the key figures notable intellectual uh, Contribution, uh, contribution to this mode uh, include Frederick Bratza, who is typically regarded as the father of political geography. So his Lebensraum or living space was one of the biggest uh, um, pieces in developing this idea of environmental determinism. He was a uh, um, natural scientist by his uh, training and botanist. So he saw this correlation uh, between the natural and political world, they, in his mind, they functioned in similar way, right? So for, uh, it was a okay case then for stronger and more powerful societies to take over uh, smaller and weaker societies to function, to prosper, because it was such a natural thing, because we see that in the natural world. And so he provided this very scientific and scholarly justification for, unfortunately, later on, German expansion, Nazi expansion. You know, he did not advocate extermination of millions of people, and he did not advocate any of the most horrible legacies of the Holocaust, but his theory provided this very well-reasoned scientific justification for Third Reich, right? And then, uh, Later on, uh, we have S4 Huntington's climatic and uh, civilizational energies. He came up with um, civilizational energy on one hand and uh, climatic energy on one hand. And he looked at where was the most ideal climatic energy. And then he superimposed it. And then surprising, not surprisingly, uh, it overlapped with what he considered high civilization energy. That's concentrated in Europe and overlap with this ideal climatic energy. So again, he justified certain climate um, produces uh, certain civilizational structures. So he, again, he was one of the most profoundly uh, influential geographers. He served as the president of the Association of America in geographers, which is the biggest association. And it's a fascinating, uh, conference, we, uh, we need the Italy, it's a great conference. <laughs> but 
during his time, he did serve as the president of the association. And then, so he, so he looks at societies and climates, and then he used his theory to understand differences, innate differences between peoples. So he used tree analogy. And then he said, look at some apples coming from certain trees that are growing in certain climatic conditions. Uh, these apples are so red cheeked and so toothsome. <laughs> So beautiful, right? Because they have the right climatic and environmental conditions. But look at these apples that grew in this really deprived soil. It's not even worthy for pigs. There are apples and apples, but the environmental conditions really define the outcome for these apples, right? And then take that, he took it even further and he said, but what are plum? If you put plum in the soil, this very nice toothsome apples grow. If you put a uh, plum in it, can it grow as apples? And then he says, no. Uh, plums are very different from apples, not only in its outward appearances, but also inward taste. What did you think? What do you think he implied that is an analogy? That some people belong in some places and other people belong in other places. Mm -hmm. And the innate differences cannot be overcome. And he precisely said that, like the Black people, not only are they different from their outward appearances, but they have inner workings that are so different from white people. So even if you put Black person in the right exact same environmental conditions, social upbringing, everything, you would provide the same exact conditions. Black person is never gonna be a white person. Absolutely racist, outrageous claim, but it was popular. His students, his students' students are still among us, right? So when we were talking about, we would like to think that this environmental determinism is a thing of a past and they were, they're long gone, but, uh, another one I was going to include is Ellen Churchill Semple. Uh, it's again one of the most prolific geographers. She also served as the president of Association of Geographers. She studied under Rattel and then she translated uh, his work uh, to English, really introduced the environmental determinism to uh, Anglophone community. But again, she did this study on wilderness and civilizing, and again, uh, she, she was profoundly an environment determinist. But as I said, um, it would be nice to think that understanding societies based on environmental conditions are a thing of the past. And then what is wrong with this uh, approach, theoretical conceptualization? It goes to this uh, very deterministic, fatalistic view of societies. It traps them into the straight jackets, right? If you have this environment to certain conditions, you're either destined to prosper or you're doomed. So it doesn't leave much agency to human creativity and doesn't leave much um, uh, agency for human capacity to adapt and change. So, but then, um, the allure of understanding society is based on their environmental and climatic conditions still around us, it's still prevalent. So how many of you read um, Dear Diamonds? Uh, still, yeah, I mean, it's one of the most popular texts. Oh my gosh, apparently it is one of the most widely assigned texts high schools and colleges. It's so widely popular. And not only that, uh, his book won a bunch of awards, including Pulitzer Prize and also Aventis Prize for Science, right? So he is regarded as this incredible source of knowledge on matters, understanding differences between societies. And then his key understanding um, why European societies were able to dominate so much of the world is goes to one simple answer. What was it? Geography. He said geography explains it all, right? And then because Europe had this right environmental conditions, 
they were able to develop the necessary technologies and um, they, of course the technologies, the guns and germs, and we were able to uh, help them take over foreign lands and distant territories and then extract their resources. But he was careful in suggesting that there are many differences between people. He did not go there. He said that in fact, people are exactly the same. They're not uh, inferior or superior like his predecessor tried to suggest. He said, no, they're not different. They're not different organically or naturally, but European societies were able to um, extract their geographic fortune so much and that put them in this place of dominance and then so what is wrong with that again it, even though he didn't go into this really racialized interpretation of societies he did give so much undue weight to environmental conditions in fact i think that's why he almost kind of given justification to european imperialism and colonialism because he oh he didn't say that but he, we can see that his uh, interpretation can suggest that Europe was nearly just enjoying the fruit of its geographic luck, and other societies, well, it's too bad. They were just destined to be so poor because their geographic conditions didn't allow them to prosper as much as European societies did. So, and again, uh, as much as we would like to think that environmental determinism is, uh, it is, it is unpopular among most scholars. I mean, most scholars have moved away and then uh, discredit uh, it is a legitimate, uh, legitimate theory to understand societies, but science is one of the very authoritative big uh, uh, journal, right? In, uh, in, in, in science, only a few years ago, 2016, there was this an article uh, that was uh, published, it's a comprehensive overview of the climate influence on human societies. And authors make a case for climate as first order uh, variable for shaping of social and economic outcomes. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't read so different from its earlier predecessors, right? And to make their uh, case, uh, the authors We've through different examples of how climate shapes social and behavior patterns. And they included infant mortality. So if you have certain climate conditions, infant mortality tends to be X and Y. And then they have even stranger um, categories, women's prom promiscuity. <laughs> if you are in certain climate conditions, you are women are intended more likely to be more promiscuous than their uh, other counterparts in other types of climate conditions and patterns of violent behaviors. Again, if you are in certain climate conditions, there tend to be more violent behaviors. So to me, again, they're not that different from this environment determinants we talked about. They don't make this actual racialized, outward racialized claims that justify um, racial supremacy of the white, I mean, it is not popular, really, but they're giving this so much credence to environmental conditions, right? So uh, what does it all have anything to do with my thesis today? So I argue that um, whereas environmental determinism tends to explain societies and social relations with the environment uh, through this causal determinacy, environment determines this, right? Um, Orientalism, which is the theory that I'm trying to use to understand this myth of nomads, Orientalism built upon this caricature uh, to construct and perpetuate stereotypical assumptions uh, about societies defined by their environmental um, uh, conditions. In other words, environment determinism offers simple answer to understand societies and Orientalists galvanize this uh, simple uh, answer um, and then make this very uh, in essentializing claims about peoples and places. So in Mongolia's case, environmental determinism would assume that nomadism is a natural product of countries 
uh, climatic environmental conditions, arid climate, high, uh, highly variable temperatures, and um, and so on, right? And then uh, Orientalists then would say Mongolians as any type of uh, stereotypes you can think of, free spirited, independent, or they don't respect boundaries, or maybe they're backward or uncivilized, and so on. Whatever stereotypes you can think of associated with nomads, <laughs> that, that's what the rentalists would do, right? So you might think that, well, that's not a very popular opinion, is it? But no, actually, it is quite a popular opinion. So the Library of Congress, uh, country study on Mongolia, you would think that it's one of the most authoritative sources on different uh, regions and cultures. Now you have the thing to say, you know. But anyway, so if you wanted to study about the country, where would you go? You might grab a copy of country study. So here it goes. The so Library of uh, Congress's Country Study of Mongolia, for instance, describes how medicine is, again, ecological adaptation that makes it possible to support more people in the Mongolian environment than uh, would be true under any mode of subsistence. This sentiment is echoed by a long list of uh, others who similarly define causal relationship between Mongolian environment and the society. So now I will uh, focus on how I think the somatic imaginary is product of Orientalism. Again, I'm going to show two different uh, sides. So first, I'm going to try to show this image of um, Mongolia as nomads, as constructed, perpetuated, sustained by what I call spectators of Mongolia. And then I'll talk about how it's also uh, performed internally by Mongolians. So if you don't mind, on the next month. So, so as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Said's uh, oriental space is primarily concerned with Europe's colonies, right? But the ways in which Mongolian identity is constructed as an ontological, an epistemological other is consistent with the way British and French and American uh, colonial enterprises constructed the oriental other from their colonial encounters of um, native peoples across the world. Let's get it. So the way Mongolian herders are appropriated as nomads echoes like the Western Western fascination with the with simultaneous like romanticization and abhorrence of their colonial subjects. And distinction is similarly mediated by again the binaries that I mentioned earlier, uh, Western superiority, oriental inferiority. So Mongolian uh, nomadic identity is a concerted production. Um, Diverse actors contribute to this general discourse, and in doing so, mutually inform each other's curiosity about this exotic other or the mystique of the nomad figure. Scholars influence travelers, and as much as travelers influence scholars, right? And then, so from prominent scholars like Charles Bodden to, again, as I mentioned, uh, the beautiful agencies such as Library of Congress who can be regarded as sources of knowledge, authoritative knowledge from Mongolia, define, uh, well, construct and perpetuate an image of Mongolia uh, as nomad, which is once glorified also at the same time as degrading, degraded. So the, nomad, the romantic of uh, uh, portrayal of nomad simultaneously essentializes them by in doing so, it creates this discursive distance from this modern, civilized, developed Western world. So uh, photographic and cinematic technologies have played a critical role in shaping popular imaginations about Mongolia and its people. As a uh, feminist scholar, Gillian Rose uh, states, the visualities deployed by the production of geographical knowledge are never neutral. They're never neutral, right? Because there is some intent behind it. So they have their foci, uh, their zooms, their highlights, 
they're blinkers and they have their blindness uh, at the end of quote that shape our perceptions and affects. So you don't just go take a picture. Whatever you included in your frame excludes, simultaneously exclude what's not included in the frame, right? So um, as similar to Don Haraway notes that there is no unmediated photography. I mean, photography is mediated. It has uh, audience, it has a uh, message, and then that's what precisely what it does, right? So. Uh, there is no unmediated photograph or passive camera obscure. There are only highly specific uh, visual possibilities, which with wonderfully detailed, active, and partial way of organizing worlds, end quote. So I think it's a beautiful way of suggesting that the photographic visual imageries present us this very partial uh, view of the world. And then on the receiving end of these images, um, we have this uh, the carefully created images. We have the viewers, but the viewers are not just passive people consuming images. They are active recipients of these images, right? And whether they uh, internalize these mes messages, um, the created messages or not, really defines whether this uh, image will sustain or not. So uh, in, in my mind, therefore, viewers, like all of us, are uh, active agents whose uh, acceptance or rejection of these Im images can be instrumental in shaping and carrying forward ideas and beliefs about uh, people that are portrayed. So I think it's uh, incumbent upon us then when we see an image, actual literal image or constructed image, discursive image, whatever image might be, I think it's really critical for us to pause and question, what is the author trying to tell us? What's the message behind it? Can I unsettle it? Can I somehow challenge this view? And then you, you can actively engage it instead of passively accepting this very highly curated image by the author, right? So um, Western cinema is definitely uh, one of the most, I think, effective way of constructing image of different uh, cultures and um, peoples and places. And then Western cinema has been fascinated uh, with the mystique of the Orient as far as, far, as, far as we, we can remember, right? And has to contribute significantly fueling uh, this myth of variant. And then just like uh, what uh, Said was talking about, the spiners between Occident versus Orient, cinema has done a remarkable job creating, expanding the distinction between the Orient and Occident, um, between Western world and the world beyond Western world. Um, despite their themes, of course, not all, every film is made the same way and it, all of them have, different themes, different storylines, different um, characters. But in spite of that, but there's this general theme across all of it, right? This Hollywood production of the Orient, they have similar, somehow similar <laughs> messages. Uh, the scene, of, um, if you think about the scene of the Orient and the landscape of the Orient, they're like arranged very um, in a narrow way so if you look at the scene of the Orient, either it's this uh, unhabitable desert landscape to this strange, exotic, um, tropical landscape with full of strange creatures. And then if you think about Oriental subject, the way they're portrayed, it again has a very narrow range. On one hand, you have this noble uh, Orient who are kind of good, and then on the other spectrum, you have this barbarian, crazy, brutal um, oriental subject. But even this benevolent, noble uh, character, they, they still come double coded. They're never the leading uh, leading protagonist in these films, right? They are all they are they are side hustles or they are the rescued ones. There are. Yeah, so there's always the subtle messages. But again, if you look at most of the films, at the end of each film, 
um, the original subjects are the ones that are defeated and Western protagonists are the ones, not only are they leading, but they are the ones who end up winning. So I have a couple of images here. Again, they're like completely fictionalized the uh, portrayal of Mongolia. But if you have never been to Mongolia, if you really haven't spent the time studying about Mongolia, learning Mongolian like you all uh, are, you have very narrow perception of this country or its people, right? But then when you watch a film, any of this, then your perception idea about the country can kind of enhance by these images. So on top, you have this flight of Phoenix, and they're referred in the films, uh, nomadic uh, bandits. <laughs> so they show up, uh, like, I don't know where to So it's about the story of a plane uh, somehow stranded on the Mongolian uh, desert. And it's like a full of thick space, like uh, who lives there except for this poor unfortunate uh, souls who call the, their home, right? It's so, there's not even a shrub, I almost. And then, uh, these people, poor uh, people, are stranded and trying to just escape this uh, what God forsaken place. Um, but these uh, nomad bandits terrorize them, right? They just show up and, and, and they capture their uh, members and kill them. And it's just they're horrible people. And at the end of the climatic uh, like scene of the film, I, I really hope to get uh, this that image, but I couldn't do it without uh, what you call it, ad. So, uh, Anyway, so what you see in the climatic ending of the film is that they somehow figure out to fix their plane and then they rise up and then they fly, the shadow is seen underneath and then they're just so helpless and dumbstruck and, <laughs> and looking upward, almost symbolically upward to these people who are going to this better place, right? So it's incredible. Uh, representation about a very small, but still managed to show the stereotypical assumption about Mongolia uh, and then its people. Uh, second one underneath, Charlie's Angels. Again, you wouldn't think that Charlie's Angels has anything to do with Mongolia, but they did have a scene about Mongols in that uh, film. So the, the trio of beautiful three where women from the Occident space uh, goes to uh, this place and then if you will see at the uh, Mongolian subjects are this mob of people. Uh, just, they're ugly, they're like loud, and they're drunk, they fight, and there's just nothing redeeming about any of these people. And of course, they Chinese, speak Chinese, right? So, mm -hmm. And so again, it enhances any stereotypes you may have about uh, Mongolia. So I was thinking, when I was thinking about the impact of um, power of cinema in shaping people's perceptions. And I was thinking about myself, when I was growing up, uh, we watched, I don't know how many, so many films about Nazi Germany. And, and they, were, they were wonderfully uh, made, produced, because most of the German subjects, uh, the Nazis were played by Eastern Germans and they speak in German and just like so, I mean, they were incredible films, but somehow it really, uh, shaped the way I saw the Germans and Nazis. And my nightmare well, at the time, childhood nightmare, included Nazis coming to my little town, right? <laughs> so it does have some powerful impact. So um, I talked about this very highly obvious fictionalized uh, representations of Mongolia uh, through these films, but on this uh, um, right hand side, you see a documentary. It's a completely different genre of uh, production, right? It's supposed to tell somewhat partial, impartial view of the world and then and it's supposed to like represent real people, real cultures without having this very uh, specific uh, fictionalized message. So In the Wild is a film about, uh, the documentary about Julie Roberts uh, going to Mongolia and living with nomadic family. And in the beginning of the film, uh, she's supposed to stay with this nomadic uh, family in her mind, in her uh, story. And she shows up, of course, before they're not there because they're nomads. Nomads don't stay in one place. So she chases them, she goes 
to a place to place and eventually she finds her nomad. And then the very next day they pack up in a very elaborate scene of unpacking their gears and put them back on this camel carts and then go. So again, and then there are so many um, uh, subtle images she uh, shares. So some of the key ones I can maybe, land is never greener on the other side of the fence because there are no fences. And land encourages sharing, not competition. Land makes uh, nomads pull together. Nomads thrive on each other's help and support. So she is, she is portraying this really good orient, oriental subject. And then she's, and her depiction of Mongolia is very benevolent, right? But again, there is this, the subtle message. So for instance, she, Concludes that she couldn't live like this, already creating distance between the civilized uh, space in which uh, from which she came uh, come from came from, and then this nomadic uh, culture she's talking about, and then she talks about the people visiting unannounced all the time and then having to use bathroom outside, and then decide ultimately decided that I couldn't live like this. So, so I think uh, even. Um, documentaries do create this uh, distinction between the rental subject or into space vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. occidental space. And then aside from Hollywood production of oriental space, both in fiction and nonfiction, and other culture outlets have contributed to shaping Westerners' perception of East, including Mongolia. So National Geographic is one of the, again, the really uh, big ones, right? Uh, and it does uh, present uh, exotic worlds, exotic places and people. And then it does so very effectively because they have incredibly talented photographers, talented writers, and they provide a very powerful view of stories of the world. And now all of us have been part of consuming these images, right? Produced by talented writers of National Geographic. So in my book, I discuss um, one particular article written in the um, uh, National Geographic about this uh, family, they call it, in the Valley, who are trying to make a move. So again, it's a story of, it's a really noble story about um, sort of family. But again, there's like the language and then the type of word usage they use implies again the distinction between and then distance between the occidental subjects and the oriental subjects. And then he would say he has wild curling cry or very um it just like makes essentialize and exoticize the subject. They're not normal people, they're exotic people, they're different people. And you know, I'm here to tell how different they are from me, right? So I think that's why um, um, play, uh, news media, magazine, they're all kind of create the distance between the oriental subject. Next one, news media is also part of this larger political economy. They are buying for profit. And just like magazines, films, and documentaries, they try to make money. In order to do that, again, they write about different places in ways that, again, enhances the exotic part of it, right? So when, when you read about articles about Mongolia, again, it's so uh, in the narrow range how they're uh, different, not how they're similar to Western subjects. So, they use the language and knowledge that feed the readers anticipated curiosity of the exotic lands and foreign people. And Mongolian identity is no exception. Employing rhetoric that specifically highlights or denounces, uh, denounces a certain aspect of Mongolness, media have played a major role in articulating Mongolian identity for the gaze of um, the Western audience. And then object, object, objectifications of nomadic identity are then commodified in Western media to reify notions of indigenous primitivity and contrasted against Western modernity. So then I argue that the, the wild nomad figure is used as uh, this object of this really voyeuristic gaze. 
an essential centrope of a rentalist imaginary, nomadism is though ultimately seen as a flaw in this global developmental trajectory. It's stuck in this primitive uh, level of civilization and it's just stuck, right? To echo the like Jim Scott and I'm not seeing in others. It's such a nomad figure I think has been both an object of uh, this between imaginary one of fantasy and one of scorn. Next one, please. So I will now uh, shift to discuss uh, the ways this essentializing trope is created in tandem with the National Mongolian Master Narrative that simultaneously um, similarly constructs Mongolia as a land of nomads. I will discuss how Mongolian nomadic identity is produced performatively in response to outsiders appetite for something exotic, something different. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the theoretical uh, framework uh, that I used. Uh, so, my uh, third approach to see uh, is informed by Judith Butler's uh, this really great work on um, performativity in ways that cultural identity is socially constructed and performed for a social audience. The Butler's work has been both provocative and transformative in the ways we talk about and understand the politics of identity. In her performative acts and gender constitution, Butler proposes to consider gender as a performative identity that is socially sanctioned and culturally nurtured. She argues that once gender identity is repetition of acts through time, and only through this repetition does the performed identity assumes embodied ex existence and lived experience. Uh, through this extended repetition of performative acts, uh, cultural identity then becomes shared experience and collective action, right? So this suggests that gender is a sum of uh, socially sanctioned and acts uh, that are repeated over time, takes gender away from its ontological certainty to dynamic variability. Instead of treating gender as an expression of what one uh, is Jutter, uh, Butler, our God, gender is something one does. So I think of the ways Mongolian culture identity is performed as a part of broader social convention inside and outside Mongolia. But because of uh, uh, its ontological assumption that Mongolian culture is a product of its environmental condition, Mongolian national narrative has been deeply shaped by its nomadic identity. Social scripts call for Mongolia, uh, the nomadic society of Mongolia has played its part to perform its identity. Therefore, Echo and Butler, I argue that Mongolian nomadic is not about what Mongolia is, rather uh, it's what Mongolia does to assume the label of nomads. And then Butler argues that identity is only performed only their social audience uh, receptive to that uh, interpretation, right? So in Mongolia, in Mongolia's case, Mongolia performs its nomadic identity because there is social audience that are receptive to that image. So as you can see, uh, uh, Mongolia does so colliding history and fantasy and reality and um, this, um, our imaginary, uh, myth uh, in the ways that um, history and distance are kind of defined. Various actors play uh, to this construction of Mongolian identity uh, based on nomadism. So I know you're giving me time, so I have quite a bit to go. So I try to wrap it up fast. With our, with our time constraints. Um, I'm not sure how long we have the room. Um, maybe. Uh, sure. Wrap it up soon. Okay, so maybe I'll try. Uh, I'll try to wrap it up fast. So uh, what I'm uh, so uh, uh, well, what I would uh, argue is that national consciousness is uh, on one hand is like understood as a precondition of nationhood, right? It's rooted in sense of shared ideals and symbols that connect otherwise disparate individuals. 
uh, symbol, uh, symbols derived from same ethnic core help bond people together and provide collective desire to overcome violence, injustice, and mobilize the nation for a greater common uh, future to echo like Anthony Smith and others. But then Mongolia simultaneously construct a sense of nationhood that came to uh, Benedict Anderson's imagined community. Uh, as uh, Anderson suggests, there is nothing organic or natural about national community. It's rather uh, constructed, right? And uh, there's various mechanisms and processes engineer feelings of community and solidarity of, uh, among diverse and often largely unrelated people. Anderson believes that there are many, uh, there are many willing to give up their lives for this imaginary community, take lives of those who are marked as enemies, and so on. So, to me, this Anderson's idea of imaginary commonwealth that's constructed and sustained through artificial tools of the state speaks to the ways various markers of Mongolian nationhood is animated by the state. And uh, Michael Bullock's banal nationalism is really uh, useful text to understand the subtle, constant reminders of nationhood. And then how, um, because they're so subtle and mundane and constant, we don't necessarily pause and uh, register its um, uh, intent, right? And then we internalize it. So he, for instance, recalls like cheering on his team's uh, victory and then realized that his uh, this feeling affect was conditioned by the socially constructed idea around teen. So we similarly uh, internalize a lot of messages created, animated by the state, and then we are unless we are consciously um, pushing against this agitating and, and pushing against countering the state narrative, we have become this unsuspecting agents of the state. Um, so we root for our team, right? So, so in uh, Mongolia, as you can see, there are many different ways Mongolia constructed nomadic identity and then on national state, as well as nomadic uh, for your family. In fact, most of national, uh, this big national official visits will involve a trip to nomadic for your family, where again, this uh, differences of uh, uh, this herd of uh, herders are so enhanced, right? They are so different, they're exotic. They're not gonna um, highlight any similarities between the visitor, but rather they showcase how different they are. And so if you see in the background, uh, maybe if you hit the next one, you might see it better. Uh, this is a chess piece. Oh, this is a chess piece. My sweet uh, dad hand carved uh, many years ago. But even my dad is, Part of this production, right? National production. And as you can see, there's the uh, mobile gear and there's horse and camel, king and queen. So we all are susceptible to this uh, construct, imaginary. And I think as scholars, we have to be mindful of uh, both the state's role and then popular imaginary. And then somewhat, someone at least ask questions, if not somehow um, unsettle images, especially if it's associated with uh, political messages. So I have a, long, a little bit more to go, but I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up. So if you have any questions. Um... I think that we can stick around for questions as long as nobody's waiting outside. Um, so as, as long as no one comes and stops us, yeah. Um, to try and take some questions. I'm not sure how if the sound will work here. So, Kenny, would you like to try and unmute and see if we can hear you? Yeah, can you hear me? Um, I'm not sure about the volume in yeah. here. If not, you could just type um, it in chat. Kenny, would yeah. you mind uh, typing your question in the chat, please? Oh, okay. Um, sure. Kenny, you look like a nomad. <laughs> <laughs> We can hear you. I can hear you. I can. Maybe, yeah. maybe we can do a Zoom or, or a room, Zoom, room, Zoom order. Yeah, that's that sounds sure. good. So while people type. Yes. Yes. I have a question. So at the end of your lecture, you started to draw on Anderson's notion of the imagined community. And for Anderson, the imagined community was a product of basically print capitalism no, sure, sure. and the shared 
sense of temporality that that produced. So specifically with regard to uh, the nomadic communities that you're discussing, mm -hmm. what was the what is the specific medium through which that shared sense of temporality uh, was produced? That's a really good question. Yes. Uh, um, so of course, that, uh, Anderson's Mahajan community speaks to this emergence of uh, the idea of nationhood that was not really not the case in Europe, right? They had allegiance to maybe someone who lived nearby, but not necessarily the wider political community. But with the advent of print capitalism, you were able to access so many people and create this uh, imaginary, according to him, uh, national ideals and uh, create this uh, um, comradeship between people who will never meet in fact, but they have the sense the idea of um, community, horizontal comradeship, right? And they regard themselves like equal subjects of this national ideals in when in fact there are so many differences in hierarchies and so on. So in Mongolia's case, uh, I would say um, uh, historically perhaps maybe oral, but in rain, uh, my uh, uh, perception, uh, my uh, thesis deals with uh, contemporary Mongolia during which time print right. is right. available medium right. in which massively produced, so poems, te uh, films, um, literature, they all glorify the state in some ways, glorify the nation and glorify uh, nomadic identity. So I so think- So how do you periodize modern Mongolia from whatever was, whatever Mongolia was before? Yeah, was so- Modern it, Mongolia. Yeah. yeah, so tricky question, I suppose, but for me, modern Mongolia, I, some part, of it, I don't have a very like a, well, it's a recent uh, explanation, but I would say um, 20th century and onwards is kind of modern, okay. especially the, early, uh, the, the emergence of contemporary state in this way we understand Mongolian state, 20s and an onward social state, post social state. Yeah, so that I would call that somehow contemporary period. But uh, maybe you can yeah. call post social state even more contemporary. But um, we can go to uh, Kenny's question now. He's just typed it out in the chat. Um, we can, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, so Kenny says, I've reacted a bit negatively in, uh, to the past when folks have called Mongolia a colony of the Soviet Union for two reasons. One, this is sometimes related to the idea that the Soviet Union made them do things, i.e. the purges. And two, Mongolia's experience was far different from the settler, settler colonialism in Inner Mongolia and Buryatia. Uh, how do we explore the similarities while emphasizing the very different experiences between uh, other Mongol and Hurtic peoples? It's a long question, Katie. There were so many parts to it. <laughs> so first of all, yeah, um, I, I see your point um, about how it is different from uh, such a colonialism, and it also very different from, for instance, Soviet Republic experience, which was officially part of the Union, and Mongolia is different. But then if you ignore all of it all, um, we, I think, um, discredit or misunderstand the really heavy hand the role that it's played in shaping Mongolian society. So, I wanted to include uh, colonial because it, to me, echoed so many different uh, ways the Europeans controlled this foreign land, specifically the superiority of the colonized versus uh, the colon col colonized subject. And of course, the Russian was the upward mobility and then um, in order to go move up the ladder, you needed to go to Russia and then speak the language and assume uh, the fraternal uh, friendship where the where Russians are regarded as the big brother, right? They're all seem to me seem to echo the colonial relations that are um, European based. Uh, in terms of differences between her communities. Um, what I uh, wanted to, oh, actually, in my conclusion thoughts, what I wanted to say is that when I say that Mongolian uh, nomadism is highly uh, constructed, I don't want to take away 
Mongolian this uh, cultural vestige, uh, vestiges, right? It, it is, of course, uh, and I don't mean to say that it's wholesale imaginary. No, in fact, I'm trying to suggest that even if we call Mongolian herders nomads, it's not the entire story of the country, right? Uh, there are so many different, we have artists, drivers, uh, nurses, all kinds of people, each uniquely contribute to the fabric of the society. But if you just hold on to one single um, story, then we overgeneralize this incredibly complex human uh, tapestry. Uh, to actually, I uh, inspired by um, uh, author and novelist uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's single story, uh, the danger of single story. So. I shouldn't generalize, and I think what I'm going with that is that each story is probably unique, and there is no single story of the herder community is a be a colonial story, settler or otherwise. Thank you. A couple of questions in, in the room. Um, yeah. uh, so, like, my question is uh, on this uh, knowledge production in the, the American uh, academic institutions about Mongolia or other places in Central Eurasia. Uh, my, my question is like, um, so when the, the Robert Hall, like the, the, the regional studies departments likes to use, these are like the places where really like the people in the US uh, to generate knowledge about Mongolia. Right. And then these institutions, like when uh, Robert Hall proposed the idea of institutionalizing this regional studies. Mm -hmm. The one of the important, like very important uh, reason is to promote the American national interest. So like, uh, what are the like, the, uh, how much has changed like since the time of the British colonialism? And then like, if you have seen like any changes, like what are like significant, like the differences about like, the producing knowledge and then advance the interest of the, the colonial the, the, the empire. So the, and then also like the, where do you see your own position on like in this space? Like as a person from Mongolia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first one, um, some knowledge production and how it was uh, um, mirrored national interest, and I can totally agree with that. But even even though a lot has changed over time, including through the work of uh, scholars like uh, subaltern scholars who I uh, called their theater, has kind of changed. And then there are different uh, subsections within, including political geography, that are much more diverse, much more complex. That happened in the past. So I think it is getting much more uh, diverse. Uh, but again, still, I think could change, could get more. So um, I think the recent, uh, our um, focus on racial violence and struggles of indigenous communities have called for inclusion of uh, the minority voices in scholarship. And I think. I hope the gatekeepers will take that to their heart and then encourage, but I think there's still uh, so much desire. So I recently I saw a blog post about Central Eurasian Studies um, uh, gives out annual book award. And then for the last many uh, years, it has given out book award. Apparently I didn't go back and see, but has been given out to um, Western scholars, no one from the region won. So maybe there is again, subtle like, uh, privileging of certain voices uh, versus others. So, so much change, not enough, in my opinion. In terms of myself, where do I belong? And then I, I, so the reason why Sayed's work really resonated with me is that I traverse different worlds. And then, of course, I feel like somewhat out of place when I go back to Mongolia now. And then again, I don't fully uh, belong here. And I'm very cognizant, aware of my own positionality, especially being in. Uh, in the um, department where social justice is one of our profound goal, yet there is differences. You do feel that um, women, a woman, and specifically women of color in academia, it's not easy, right? So unfortunately, I would say that my position, 
my own position is still navigating and negotiating my own place in this discipline, in this academic world that is deeply again higher price uneven. And then uh, we had another question in the room. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I did have a question if you have one from the chat. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a question from near the beginning, actually. Uh, you were talking about two popular common conceptions of Mongolia. You have people who say, oh, Mongolia, that's from China, right? And essentially know nothing about Mongolia. Right. Uh, some people that I've met don't know the Mongolia exists. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, and then you have people who have this uh, kind of uh, this stereotype sort of post-colonial view of Mongolia, right? That, oh, Mongolia is a country of people who are herders and they're nomads, right? right. Um, so you have the stereotype view and the complete ignorance. Mm -hmm. And between those two, I'm curious what you find to be more problematic or more harmful, the ignorance or the, the wrong conception of the incomplete conception. Oh, that's a tricky question. Yeah, that's a tricky question. So I would say uh, for most Mongolians, the easy answer is the first one. They, it's very passionately important for Mongolia to be recognized as separate from China, right? So most Mongolians would take it to heart that they at least have to know that Mongolia is not part of China. That would be very, very profoundly um, strong opinion. Uh, but I guess for me, the way I feel is that I, I'm used to people not knowing much about Mongolia. And then when they know something about Mongolia, I do actually get somewhat touched by it. So mm -hmm. maybe even though it's somewhat ignorant, at least they have some perception, but it's better than nothing, maybe. So I guess that's, so I know one person, maybe they misheard me. I think Mongolia was like Angola, right? And I thought I didn't look what Africans look like. So that was very, very wild. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any more questions? I don't think we have any more in the chat. Yeah, uh, Anton? Yeah. Uh, now there's an interesting article from a few years back called uh, Ambiguities of the Kazakh Nomadic Heritage. Mm. And the central argument in that is that um, this idea of nomadism is both central to the idea of the Kazakh nation, sure. but also peripheral to every other aspect of Kazakh life, because it's basically all about the yurt and the horse. but in terms of Kazakhstan's actual political goals for the future, they have nothing to do with Oh, sure. Mobile <laughs> uh, pastoralism. So I was wondering how does how do these internal narratives of Mongols as nomads in Mongolia intersect with other narratives of Mongolia, say, as a democracy, a globalizing, modernizing state, a liberal economy, and so on? So, yeah, it's a really great question. So, in, uh, in my um, book, I propose. Uh, Again, it's just my perception. And then again, it's right or wrong. It's up to you uh, to decide, agree or not. So one of my uh, interpretation was the reason why Mongolia hold on to this very nomadic uh, identity is maybe to reclaim peace of self, like that, that somewhat distinct in this process of homogenization, uh, capitalism, and ex uh, absorption, and then and we are being pushed, pushed more and more into this completely commodified, um, uneven capitalist social relations, right? So perhaps it's like a, an effort to reclaim a little bit of itself. I'm, just, I'm sorry, it's mine. Uh, so yeah, and I think we are, so what I would say is negotiating its identity. One goal wants to be, um, um, somewhat developed and have resources to provide for its citizens, have provide uh, infrastructure and, and so on. And at the same time, I want to hold on to its very um, this deeply uh, held thematic view and, and identity. Thank you. Uh, do I'm sorry for my phone. <laughs> uh, any more questions either in the Zoom meeting or in the room? Um, otherwise, can I ask? Okay, well, we can wrap it up and we can just treat the, uh, the phone as the bell. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just um, thank you once again, Dr. Miyadar. It's been a real pleasure having you. And, uh, yeah.